hope that y'all had a really great week this week, and we're going to be starting off singing, Give Me Oil in My Lamp. situated here. Hope you can see good. I'm going to use visuals a little bit today so you can see those. Uh, but we've been studying in the book of Matthew really and going through it and teaching from it. I hope you've been enjoying it. I've been enjoying doing it with you. Uh, I've seen where several of you are tuned in to us and we appreciate that. Uh, we hope it's the Lord to hear. We don't do this for our our own glorification, we do it for His. And that's the way the Bible says things needs to be and should be because there's no other name under heaven whereby you can be saved. 
We can't save you, but Jesus can. And so we want the attention to be upon him, uh, upon the Father, and upon the Holy Spirit. So as we start today, we kind of look back and think about what we did last time. Last time we studied about a man by the name of John. They called him John the Baptist, and we'll see kind of a little further into that uh, today as we go through our lesson. But John the Baptist was, oh, such a good man, but he wasn't a perfect man. And so John the Baptist had a job, and that was to prepare the way of the Lord. And we said that was for Jesus' first coming. And then who does Jesus use for uh, to prepare the way for his second coming? And that is you and me. That is our job. We're to get people ready for that. And when he comes back the second time, he says we'll be joined together with him up in the cloud. And all those that are saved will be changed in a moment of a twinkling of eye and go up to meet him in the cloud. And uh, we know those who are dead will rise first and go to join him. And then we in the twinkling of eye. So it's very uh, close there in time uh, where we go up to meet him in the air. Now, for our lesson today, wanted to start talking about Jesus a little bit more. Uh, Jesus would have been in his shop in uh, Nazareth where he worked in a carpenter shop. His daddy had started it and Jesus had continued on that uh, work. And uh, while he was working up there one day, a message came and said, hey, have you heard? There's a man by the name of John. He's down to the Jordan River and he is baptizing people. And Jesus knew at that time that it was time for him to start his ministry because John was the one preparing the way. And Jesus knew that he would be following right shortly after that. So Jesus started closing up the little shop there in Nazareth and started to tell his mother, hey, uh, mother, uh, it's time for me to go down and be with John. Uh, and it's time for my ministry to start. Jesus would have told his mother in love and she would have understood, uh, you know, it would have been hard for him uh, to tell his mother that. And his mother, it would have been hard for her to think about that uh, because she had had Jesus there for 30 years and uh, it had been wonderful years spending time with Jesus. But just think, we don't get to spend eternity we who are saved will get to spend eternity with Jesus Christ up in heaven. And, you know, if it took him only uh, seven days to create the moon and the stars, uh, and he's been working on uh, heaven all this 2,000 years, think how wonderful that's going to be. It'll be something very special that he's preparing for me and you. As we start out, we see that Jesus started on his way down to uh, the area where John was close to Jerusalem. He is out in the wilderness and he was down to the Jordan River baptizing people and it would have been uh, an exciting time. Uh, John had big crowds coming and listening to him, but John didn't want to take the credit for himself. John said, uh, they said, are you the Messiah? He said, no, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and undo his sandals. Uh, and so he was a humble man and he was doing what he knew to be right. It says as Jesus started coming to him that John the Baptist looked and it, uh, the Holy Spirit descended from heaven as a dove and lit on Jesus' shoulder and John knew that this was the man and a voice came from heaven. God the Father spoke and said, this is my beloved son, hear him. And that would have been amazing. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We say we uh, worship uh, a God made of three beings. And we know that this is one of the few places in the Bible where all three come together, but all three came together for the starting of Jesus' ministry here upon the earth. So this was going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. So he came to John and he said, hey John, uh, I'm ready to be baptized. And uh, John looked at him and says, well, I, <laughs> I don't need to be baptizing you. You need to be baptizing me. And 
Jesus said, let it be so for this time. And Jesus was showing you and me by example that we need to be baptized. And uh, what does baptizing represent? Well, as Jesus uh, or us, if we're standing up in the water, it shows Jesus' life. As he goes under the water, his death and rising back out of the water, uh, his burial and his resurrection. And so that's what one thing that baptism represents. It also represents something else. We are becoming these days a part of the church and we are going to serve God. And so Jesus was ready to serve. He was ready to carry on his ministry here upon the earth. If you remember, uh, one of the things that Jesus had done, even as a boy, was he studied the scripture and he knew uh, what the scripture was. But after he was baptized, the Bible says that he was taken by the Holy Spirit out in the wilderness to be tempted. He was not tempted by God. He would be tempted by Satan or the devil, as we call him. Uh, the devil is not someone with uh, horns on his head and a forked tail. He would like for us to think that because that steer is run us off. But he's a very lovely creature and he comes to us uh, in disguise. Uh, he don't want to uh, let us see who he is coming because we'd know to avoid him. But if he can come to us in disguise, then he can deceive us. And he's called the deceiver in the Bible. And so out in the wilderness, you would have seen a few animals that would have been out in the wilderness. And they would have been wild animals out there uh, of all sorts. It would have been a little bit of a scary place to be sometimes. And one thing there is, is these rocks. There's rocks all over the place out there. And uh, Jesus was uh, out in the wilderness. Thank you. I dropped some of those rocks right off the board. Uh oh, they don't want to stay up there. They're not sticking very well. I'll take them off of there. Thank you for helping me with that. Well, Jesus was out there. And so uh, the devil was coming to him to tempt him. And when you get to thinking about it, why in the world would anybody, even the devil, come out to tempt him? Uh, uh, well, the devil had a history of doing this. It started with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And the devil had won every battle from the start, from the first man and woman all the way down to the present day that he was there with Jesus. He had won every time. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means everybody had sinned. And uh, just to kind of give you uh, a little record of that, let me take some of the main people that's uh, mentioned in the Bible and go through it with you and review that with you. There was Adam and Eve, and they were tempted in the Garden of Eden. And the devil uh, tried to get them to partake of the forbidden fruit and they partake, uh, they partook of it and when they did uh, they uh, sinned and they lost and the devil won. And then we go down to a man who's very uh, highly respected in the Bible and that's a man by the name of Moses and uh, Moses uh, was out in the wilderness and when he was out in the wilderness uh, the people came to him and said, we need water. We want you to produce water right here. And Moses knew that it was impossible for him, but it was possible with God. He asked God, and God said, okay, we'll do that. They need water, and we want to uh, give them what they need. And so uh, at that time, he told Moses to wave his rod over the stone, and water would come forth. So uh, the people had agitated Moses made him angry. Uh, people can do that. And so he waved the rod over the stone, but then he struck it and he said, must we bring forth water from this rock, taking credit for what was really God's to him and his brother Aaron, and that was sin. Moses had failed, Moses had sinned, and the devil had won again. We go to a little bit later in the Bible, we run into a man by the name of Elijah, 
He won a great battle because God had sent fire on top of Mount Carmel and uh, the battle was won by the Lord and then uh, Queen Jezebel says, you know, you've destroyed uh, 450 prophets of Baal, but this time tomorrow I will destroy you, Elijah. And so Elijah uh, was afraid and he ran. So he ran for 40 days. Uh, he would have been a long way from there to the time the 40 days was up. But then God asked him a question. God's always good about asking me new questions. And sometimes they're hard to answer because he points out our sin. He said, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah says, oh, everybody else is sinning. And so I had to leave town because Queen was going to have me killed. And he says, Elijah, that's not true. Uh, the devil had lied in Elijah's heart. And he said, I've got 7,000 people back there in that bend their nail, need to bail. And so he knew he was wrong. How long would it take him to get back? Well, if he'd run as quickly as he had come there, it would take 40 more days. That'd be 40 and 40 is 80. And so he was out of place. Those people needed him back there. Where does God need you today? We won't, don't want to be out of place. But the point of this is he had sinned and Elijah had lost and the devil had won again. Then there was a man by the name of David in the Bible. And David, uh, his sin was he looked upon a beautiful woman and committed sexual sin with her. And because of that, David lost. There was trouble in his household from then to the day he died. And that's the way it is in life. If you commit sexual sin and get into trouble uh, sinning with that, it'll bring problems into your house forever. Uh, so don't do that. Now, David had lost and the devil had won again. There's no old saying in baseball, he's batting a thousand. That means that the devil had not made a mistake yet. He had won every time. And now he was going to tempt Jesus and try to get him to sin. And so as he comes to Jesus, I'll, uh, I'll draw in a little bit closer here uh, and see how he's going to try to get uh, Jesus to sin. The Bible, there's a verse in it that says the wages of sin is death. And so he had won against everyone up to this time and now Jesus had been announced by the Father. He said, uh, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And so uh, the devil is first going to try to um, get him to sin. And he says, uh, I'm going to wait for about 40 days before I do this. Jesus had been out in the wilderness. He was hungry by this time. And the devil came to him and he said, uh, if you are the son of God, command these stones that they become bread. And Jesus' reply was, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so Jesus had won. He had uh, won the first test against uh, Satan. I strike one against the devil. And then the devil took him up to Jerusalem and put him on the highest part of the temple. And he said, hey, Jesus, cast yourself down because it is written, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered again and he said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And so strike two on the devil. Jesus had done the right thing again. And then it says the devil took Jesus up into uh, a grand high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, if you will fall down and worship me, uh, then I'll give all these kingdoms to you. Uh, so he had tempted Jesus again. And Jesus said, uh, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And so this was strike three. The devil was out 
and he had lost and it says that the devil left him now if you'll remember we've been talking about perfect spotless lambs that was used in sacrifice and this was to represent Jesus Christ not ever sinning this was a hard hard thing to do and so Jesus here was tempted of the devil and he didn't sin that time either and so the devil went away it says that the angels came and they ministered to Jesus they brought him some food and probably something to drink and Jesus was probably thankful the, that came really from God and they uh, were glad to bring it uh, they were honored to be able to bring that to Jesus now we say all those things there to get down to a little bit harder thing in the Bible is for people to learn how to apply what they've learned in the Bible to their everyday life and if you'll listen real close I'm going to try to show you what all this represents how we use it in our life and what it means to you and so the devil makes temptations look ever so good in the beginning it looks beautiful but in the end how ugly it looks and how much problems and wrong it is in the end if uh, uh, it is his will to destroy you and me if we yield to the temptation it does uh, cause us a lot of trouble and heartaches the devil tempted Jesus in three ways and people who keep up with it even better than I do say that there's three ways that we're tempted there is the uh, lust of the flesh the lust of the eye and then the last thing is uh, the third temptation that the devil uses against us is the pride of life and so I'm going to break those three things down. I'm going to give you two examples to show you that the devil uses this kind of as a pattern. The first one was the lust of the flesh. Jesus had gone without food for how many days? Forty. And because he had gone without food for forty days, he was very hungry. So his flesh was wanting some food. Remember what the devil said? Hey, turn these bread, these stones into bread. Uh, that would have been an easy thing for him to do. He could have done it. Now, for Adam and Eve, I'm going to show you what he said there. What he said to Adam and Eve was to look at that forbidden fruit. God said they could take of any other fruit in the whole garden except the one that was from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they were not supposed to take of it. Now, when they were out in the garden, they were probably looking for food. And because they were looking for food, they were hungry. And so when they looked at it, they thought, mm, this looks good to eat. And so he had uh, appealed to the lust of the flesh for them. And then the second thing he did was, uh, it, it, the second way he tries to get a sin is the lust of the eyes. And so uh, he took Jesus up into the highest part of the temple and he said, cast yourself off. And uh, he said, because the angels are going to bear you up. Man, think how spe spectacular that would have been if Jesus had done that. He could have cut short all this building up of following. Everybody would have looked at him and said, wow, only God can do this. And we're going to follow him. And he could have cut three years of serving God off and... Uh, he would have been able to have put off a lot of suffering there. And then there's the pride of life. That was the third one. Well, I forgot to tell you about how, uh, how that would have happened with Adam and Eve. Now, Adam and Eve, uh, the fruit looked good. And they thought, you know, this is pretty fruit. I'm going to take it and I'm going to eat it. And then the last thing was the pride of life. And what the devil was saying, I'm going to show you these kings of the world, and you can rule them right now. You don't have to go through all that pain and suffering on the cross, and you don't have to waste your time waiting on the Father. You just uh, 
can sidestep that cross and start ruling right now. Well, the result of that is you and I would have had no Savior. They would have been, uh, you know, the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Our sin debt would not have been paid. We'd have to pay it ourselves. We'd have to been separated from God forever. And by doing what Jesus did, by going to the cross and waiting and being patient and doing things the way God the Father said, then uh, he did all these things and we have a Savior being Jesus. Now, uh, that was the uh, uh, pride of life. And so uh, Adam and Eve, if you remember the, how the devil tempted them, the way he tempted them in the Bible was he said, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll be like God knowing good and evil. And he was telling a part truth, and that's the way the devil does. He tells us a part truth, so we believe it. But what would have happened uh, did happen. Uh, he uh, had told them they would be like God, being wise, and they would be smart like God. But see, that was a lie also. So Jesus had overcome these three temptations, and so can we. You remember in that first our second lesson that I was teaching you how Jesus went to the temple and how he studied so hard and he was trying to learn all those scriptures. Well, uh, uh, there's a verse in the Bible that says, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And Jesus had learned those lessons very well. All three of those answers that he gave to Satan each time he was tempted or found in the book of Deuteronomy. First in the eighth chapter of Deuteronomy and then the last two are in the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy. And he had answered Satan each time with those scriptures that he had uh, memorized when he was a boy. Um, I'm going to read some scriptures to you and I want you to listen to them because this is God's word and this is what he says. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 15. This is another verse. For we do not have a high priest, talking about Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That's found in the book of James 1.13. And then it says, God tempts no one uh, of evil. The devil is the one, and he's called the tempter in the Bible. He is the one who does the tempting. And the Bible says that the devil walks to and fro upon the earth, seeking whom he may destroy. The, temp, uh, the devil tempts us to make our situation worse, and God uh, tests us to make us better. We have a weapon that we can use against the devil. It's the one that Jesus used, and I'm, it was it's clearly broken out in the book of Ephesians for us. Ephesians 6, 17 says, the sword of the Spirit is what we should use, and that is the Word of God. And so we need to memorize scriptures. James 4, 7 says this, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Did you see what we did a while ago? We talked about Jesus resisted the devil. He used the scripture against him. And what did the devil do? It says he went away. John, 1 John, uh, there's a difference between St. John and 1 John. It's 1 John, 2 John, 3 John later on. And if you're looking at 1 John toward the end of your Bible, chapter 4, verse 4, this is what the verse says. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Meaning the Holy Spirit comes to live within you when you get saved. And the question becomes, is Jesus living in you right now? He is if you've been saved. If you've been saved and you've asked Jesus to come into your heart and soul, then he is living within you. Now, I'm going to use my little wordless book here and I carry it with me all the time and present the plan of salvation. And you that already know it, just use it as practice, okay? The Bible says that this color 
of course, we know to be gold. And the Bible says at the very end, the last two chapters in it, that the streets of heaven are paved with gold and the houses up in heaven are made with gold. And so it's going to be a beautiful place where there's no sickness, no death, no tears. Uh, there will be no graves up there because there's no death. But there will be angels beyond number. There's going to be the tree of life that's going to be up there. And there's going to be a book. And it's called the book of life. And if you've been saved, your name's written in the book of life. Never to be erased out of it. Uh, uh, again, you didn't get there because you were good enough to get there. You were good. You got there because God loved you and he made a way for you to be saved. If we look at our life without it being spotted up with our sin, uh, being without spotting and blemish before we're born, then as we go through life, uh, we put down dots, our page gets covered up. The Bible says uh, the wages of sin is death, Romans 3, 23. Uh, and it says that the gift, I mean, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that's Romans 3.23 and it says the wages of uh, sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord that's Romans 6.23 uh, and so what is that gift? It's found in John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life that means you can have everlasting life it's a gift that's being given. given. So what do you have to do? You have to receive it. Well, what verse tells us about that? St. John 1.12 says, For as many as receive him, to them gave you power to become the children of God. And you remember I said, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open the door, I will come in. God wants to come into your heart. He wants to help you overcome temptation. He wants to be there in the form of the Holy Spirit to give you comfort. He helps me to understand Scripture. He'll help you to understand Scripture because He is the light of the world. And His Word enlightens us now. And that's what we have to depend on. Not feeble words from a man like me, but from the Word of God, which carries the importance of God which carries the authority of God, which carries the, the promise of God. He loves you. Why do you think he makes things out of gold? Why do you think he uh, let Jesus come here and die for you? Because he loves you and he wants you to be his child. Would you pray and ask him to come into your heart and cover your sin with his blood? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God who came down from heaven and lived on this earth and died on the cross and shed his blood for you and that he arose from the grave on the third day and uh, that he is God. If you believe those things, then you can be saved. But you will not be saved until you ask. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. And God will do those things for you. And you can be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's what it says in the Bible. It's simple. God didn't want to make it too hard. God bless you for listening to us. I thank Stephen for helping. I thank Abby and I thank Olivia for helping me with this. I thank you for listening in to this. If you have a friend that you would like to listen to it, Please invite them to it. That's the only advertisement we get for these lessons is what you do and how you uh, respond to your friends. So boys and girls and adults, if you're out there, encourage your children and grandchildren and hope you uh, got something out of today's lesson. God bless you. I love you. And God loves you a whole lot more. Thank you. Yeah.